Well, uh, it's seven o'clock, so I want to go ahead and get started. I want to honor everybody's time. Uh, uh, I want to welcome you and tell you we're excited you're here because this is the first time we've ever done that. So we hope you understand if we have a few hiccups along the way. Well, this is the first time I've ever done this too. So if I start um, giggling, it's because it's just crazy. So if you have questions, I'm gonna be like the moderator. You can type them into the chat box if you will. And I will stop Keith along the way every once in a while to answer your questions. Um, nod your head if that's okay with y'all. Okay. Okay, good. Um, um, I put a note there in the in the chat box. Keith does have two handouts that she sent me. So if you want to receive those, send me an email. So write down my email. My name is Debbie Dillion and my email is D-D-D-I-L-L-I-O at ncsu.edu. So that's in the chat box. So if you have questions, type, type them in the chat box. Make sure down at the bottom it says to everyone, so I'll be sure and see those. Um, so now what I want to do is I want to get started. I want to turn the show over to Keith. Keith and I worked together for over 12 to 14 years up in Virginia in uh, Virginia Cooperative Extension, and she and I became real good friends, and so we're, we're good, good friends, and I knew she had had this presentation already pretty much done. I've seen her do her dying uh, demonstrations at different festivals and things. And so she's not only a dyer, but she's a weaver, she's a spinner, and she's also a Master Gardener volunteer uh, from Dare County, North Carolina. Uh, she raised two sons and uh, she worked for 39 plus years in the Loudoun County Extension Office. And she learned a lot. And I like to tell people that what she liked to do most was identify insects and snakes when people brought them. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, she sent me a little bio. So I'm going to read part of what she's written down here for y'all. Uh, she says that yarn colors were limited in the 1970s. And if she wanted to weave with colors, she would have to dye the yarn. Along with her copy of Peterson's Field Guide to Wildflowers and Anne Bliss's North American Dye Plants, she began scouring the Blue Ridge and Shenandoah Valley and pretty much wherever she happened to be for potential dye plants. This had several benefits. She learned how to identify many different kinds of plants and their dye possibilities. And she obtained a myriad of colors for weaving. She's demonstrated natural dyeing at many festivals and fairs, and she's taught her fellow fiber craftspeople what she's learned. Uh, it's been a lifelong passion, and it gives her the creative outlet that she deserves. Let's see, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make sure everybody's muted. Can you hear me? It's Susan. Yes, I can hear you, Susan. I'm oh. going to put you on mute, though, because I'm fixing to turn it over to uh, Keith. If you, okay. have, if you have questions, type them in the chat box, if you will, okay? So, Keith, uh, now if you want to share your screen and get started, you can. Okay, bear with me. Okay. Uh, wait a minute. Share Hold your on. screen, and then you'll get uh, that. Open your PowerPoint. Open the PowerPoint and then I'm going to put that down there and then I'm going to share the screen there. Okay, so there you is. all can see. We can see it. All right, so let me go here, slideshow from beginning. Okay. Oh, cool. And y'all are over, y'all are all over on the other side. <laughs> awesome. So I can see, I can see everybody. Okay. So, um, this presentation was done for the Dare County Master Gardeners in their library, um, winter library series that we had. I became a member of the Dare County Master Gardeners in 2015. And they very quickly realized that 
I like to talk. Actually, I never shut up. <laughs> but um, so I offered to, you know, they said, what do you, what do you interest, you know, what are some of your interests? And so I said, well, I really like to do natural dyeing. And so um, they talked me into doing, redoing a presentation that I had done for the Daughters of the American Revolution, the DAR, up in Loudoun County, Virginia. So this is, this is kind of a, this is kind of using stuff that I used to do in Virginia, where I lived in the Shenandoah Valley and in the Outer Banks, where there's not very much stuff to dye with. But I found some. So, okay. So y'all are all master gardeners? No? Okay. All right. So then I'll just talk briefly about Master Gardeners. Master Gardeners is a volunteer group. In Dare County, it's 100, 100 plus. I don't think it's that many now. Trained and supported from um, NC State's land grant universities, NC State and NCAT and T or ATT. Um, volunteers receive 13 weeks of intensive research before they become a certified master gardeners. And so pretty much what we, we do is, um, let me go back. How do I go back? Okay. What master gardeners pretty much are charged to do is to educate the public using recommended gardening practices to conserve natural resources. So we want to protect our soil, our plants, our water, and so that's what Master Gardeners are all about. And it's a great, um, it's a great organization. It's fun to be a part of a Master Gardener group. Um, so now I'm going to talk about naturally dyed yarns. Naturally dyed, natural dyeing is where you use plant material or insect material to um, apply color to wool, or you can do it with cotton and linen also, but I pretty much only used wool. The, um, the plant materials a lot of times are not fast on the, on the yarn, so you have to make those yarn, you have to make it so that they will, so that the dye stuffs will adhere to the yarns. So, what I'm going to show you today are some of the some of the plants that I have used um, to dye to dye these yarns. All these yarns that you see on the screen right there, they're all mine. Those are all samples of yarn that I have dyed. This is a again, I'm a weaver, and this is a rug that I that I um, designed and wove many years ago. And these are all this rug is made with um, natural dyes, and I'll bet you. This rug is probably 30 years old. Um, it's never really been out in the light, so it probably would fade some if I had it in the light, but the blues are from indigo. The browns are from um, walnut. The beige color is from um, sumac, the red sumac. So those are, those are just, that, those are some of the colors that you can get using natural dyes. This is another rug that I designed and wove, and another again I'm using um, I'm using walnut a lot, um, some sumac, some indigo, and then where you see greens, I dyed the green first. I dyed it with yellow, and then I dipped it in indigo to get the green colors. So there's there's three there's three different ways that that you can, the dyes will adhere to, um, to yarn. One of them, and you're going to hear me use these words over and over again, mordant dyes are chemical salts used to permanently fix the dye to the fiber. So if you think about Velcro, Velcro, when you get something close to Velcro, Velcro grabs onto it and holds onto it. So when you're using a mordant on, on wool, wool has a lot of scales and a lot of little openings for dye to adhere to. So if you pre-mordant your wool and then you put the, put the yarn in the dye pod, it will immediately adhere and, get, and give you very vibrant colors rather quickly. Um, and you can also change the colors of dyes 
by adding stuff like um, you can put ammonia in the dye bath and that will make it more alkaline and that will give you more orangey red colors or um, you can add acids like vinegar and that will just that will just brighten it up so remember the word mordant dyes so some of the mordants that are metallic salts are potassium aluminum sulfate which is alum and that's just plain old store grade go to the grocery store and buy canning supplies alum um, and it is actually the only um, at more that I use anymore. I used to use all of those other ones, but I don't anymore. Um, tin is stannous chloride. It's, it's toxic to you and to the environment, but it really brightens up colors. It, it makes very pretty colors, but it's not worth it. Um, iron, you can use an iron pot. You can throw um, nails in the pot and let them rust and that'll give you iron. So, and all iron does is just darken colors. Copper sulfate is the stuff that they put in ponds to kind of green up ponds. And um, it's not something that I use. I have it, but I hardly ever use it anymore. But it will green up a yellow dye. So if you dye with goldenrod and then you put it in a copper pot, most likely it's gonna get green. So, um, some of the mordants that are plant acid mordants, now these would be um, mordants that you would use on cellulose fibers like linen, cotton, tinsel, bamboo, all of those fibers are cellulose. They are, the fibers come, they don't come from an animal or an insect like protein fibers, they come from um, plants. So tannic acid, is a mordant that you can use um, to pre-mordant any of those cellulose fibers. And that's pretty fairly easy to get around here because, um, well, maybe not here in Raleigh or no, y'all are in Charlotte. So you probably do have swamps down there somewhere, but swamp water is high in tannic acid. Oxalic acid is actually poisonous, but it does occur in the juice of um, sorrel, and rhubarb, rhubarb. It also ends up in the bottom of wine, wine sometimes. Cream of tartar is another one that's produced as a deposit in vinegars and wines. And acetic acid, of course, is vinegar. So those are all the plant acid mordants. Sometimes you want to acidify the yarn. You have to acidify cellulose yarns for them to be able to um, take the dyes. So there are three different kinds of natural dyes. A vat dye develops color after their application through oxidation, and that's predominantly, well, it is the only, it's indigo. Indigo is, is a vat dye. Direct dyes become fixed within the fiber without the assistance of any substance. Walnut, I don't know if you've ever picked up what, black walnuts, but you get black hand or brown hands or, or wear it, whatever. Um, and so you don't have to use any more at all with, with black walnut. And black walnut is one of my favorite dyes. It's so easy to use. I usually just take a whole pot of black walnuts, put them in pantyhose to keep the walnut pieces from getting all over the dye. And then I just let it ferment for, for months. And sometimes I'll take the yarn out and just toss it in there and let it sit out there. It's pretty stinky, you gotta do it outside. Um, so, and then the, there's mordant dyes, which I've talked about the mordants already, where you have to have, you have to use a substance to permanently attach the, the dye to the fiber. So here's, here's an example of that dye. This is indigo. These are colors of indigo that, um, I've dyed. Of course, that's from that rug. And then over on the right hand side are, um, just different color, different shades of indigo. When you, when you dye with indigo, when you take it out of the dye bath, which is yellow, and you hold it up to the, to the air, it turns blue. It's like magic. It's a fun one to demonstrate. 
So here's an example of black walnut, different kinds of black, different shades of black walnut. The one up at the top, <clears throat> the real dark brown, that yarn was probably sitting in the, um, for, in the pot for a very long time. And um, so the lighter colors, even that real beigey color, that's all walnut. It's just however long you leave it in the pot. So now we're gonna get into some of the, most plants that you dye with have to have a mordant in order for that dye to attach to the fiber. <clears throat> the only ones that I've talked about so far that don't need a mordant are indigo and walnut. And those are pretty much the only two. Everybody else has got to have a mordant. So I use, again, I use um, alum. So this, um, this is a picture of two, those are two rovings, wool rovings. I'm a spinner too, occasionally. Um, and so the one, the pink one on the left, both of the, both of these colors came from prickly pear pears. You know, those little burgundy pears that show up on prickly, prickly pear plants. Um, I went and harvested <laughs> A bunch of those from a friend's house, not knowing that those little pears have those little stickers in them too. Um, so I got stickers all over me. But anyway, the the one on the left was more pre mordanted with alum, and when I put it in the dye bath, the fresh fresh dye bath, that's what color it turned almost immediately. The one on the right hand side, I was using. Um, what did I use on that one? Fiber on the right. Oh, I'm, I mordanted it with uh, vinegar. And so I took that after I took the other one out of the pot, then I put the yellowy kind of pinky yellow one in the pot and it had been mordanted with vinegar. And so those are the two different shades. So when you have a, when you have a dye pot, there, here's an example. You use alum for one and vinegar for the other one and you get two different colors, which actually kind of have the same tone. I mean, you know, it's got like that pink in it. So anyway, it's, it makes for an interesting um, dye experience to, to dye using different <clears throat> methods of mortising. So now I'm going to talk about the old world. In the old world, I'm referring to areas of like Europe and Asia, um, Africa. And so as you can see, there's a there's a pharaoh and he's got on clothing and his clothing is colored. Actually, they used a lot of color in Egypt. And so they found dye recipes around 2600 BC in China. And uh, of course, fabric in King Tut's tomb showed the presence of matter. And then those people in Gaul, which I think is Scotland, um, dyed, themse dyed themselves blue with woad. So woad is the first one I'm going to talk about, and it is an old world um, dye. And I will also tell you on a lot of these slides that I'm showing you, the words are written in basically the colors that you get from that plant. <laughs> Decided to, to play with that a little bit. So woad dyes blue. And um, the plant part is leaves that you use, leaves and um, stems. So it was one of the first dyes to make the green outfits of Robin Hood's men. The Celts used it as early as 55 BC. So they would, they would take the leaves and they would ferment them for a while. And it made such a foul stench that early woad dyers were prohibited in England from popular, um, heavily populated areas. And even Queen Elizabeth I decreed that no woad processing could take place within five miles of wherever she happened to be. Um, so it was introduced, woad was introduced to the U.S. from Europe during colonial times, and it is a source of the in indigo pigment. And because of that, it when indigo has to go through a whole different kind of dye process than any other plant. But it is native to Europe, but it does grow here. Weld 
is a plant that um, it's another old world plant. It's it's high. It gives you a really highly concentrated yellow, and um, so they they would use that pigment to dye. Um, it will. Anyway, they found it. They found the seeds at Neolithic sites in Switzerland, and it was, and they assumed that it was used as a dye. It actually is an annual, but it too grows around here. Matter is a root that um, it comes from a plant that's in the pea family. So when you grow matter, you have to realize that you're going to be. You have to pull up. The entire plant. You can't just use the leaves. You actually have to pull it up and get the roots and grind the roots. It takes a long time to get enough matter to die with. It's cheaper just to buy it. You can buy it from, I think it comes from Turkey. Um, but matter was found in linens in Egyptian tombs. Britain was using it in the 10th and 11th century. The famous color turkey red. I don't know if you've ever heard of that before, but that was developed from matter. So during the Middle Ages, people who died and used, made and dyed hats, called hatters, often used heavy metals in their dye baths as a mordant because they didn't wear protective gloves or masks or didn't know that any of that stuff was um, toxic. They absorbed toxic levels of um, the chemicals causing them to be deranged, hence the word mad hatters. So um, matter, in order to get a really good red out of it, you have to use potassium chrome. And it's chrome is very toxic, so that's not something that I would ever use. But you can, you can use alum. The colors that you see down there of the, of the yarn are colors that, um, I use, that I got out of using alum only. So there, here we get to an insect. This is an insect dye, and this was a scale insect that feeds on oaks, and it yields a crimson dye. And it was, um, of course, it's from the Mediterranean. It was used as a dye stuff in Egypt in the third and fourth centuries. It wasn't until 1714 when somebody discovered that the galls that they thought were galls were actually insects. But during the um, 16th century, Spain was exporting Kermes insects from, um, from the New World. So here we go with um, indigo. Indigo, the plant part is leaves. These are, those look terrible, but those are cotton, uh, not cotton, those are wool rovings that I spun into yarn. And um, it's a native, indigo grows all over the world. There are plants that produce the indigo pigment all over the world. There are, there's a plant in Asia. There are, um, it's the same pigment that's in woad, which was in um, Great Britain. It was also in, um, the Navajo Indians actually had something that they were using to produce blue that had the indigo pigment. So it was really and truly all over the world and it's quite a process to make indigo. So it's kind of it's kind of interesting to figure out, you know, they didn't have internet, they didn't have any newsletters or anything. So how did all these people figure this out? Um, so you have to soak the leaves in liquid and you let them, um, you let them ferment for a while and then that extracts the blue dye. But the blue dye will not adhere to anything because it has to, it has to go through a process to produce something that's going to adhere to the fibers. So um, anyway, it, they, they used to use, one of the liquids that they used to use to reduce indigo in Great Britain was they would put, it, they would put barrels outside of pubs for the um, gentlemen to to urinate in, and they would use the urine to um, for their dyes. <laughs> um, so, ladies' bed straw is another another plant. We have a plant very similar here. Um, I've seen it on my walks, but they're they're real spindly little plants. But they give you uh, reds and yellows. The one and only time I ever harvested those, and I harvested a lot of them. Um, 
I tried to dye with them and I got this really, really, really pale pink. It was kind of sad because I had to kill all those plants. But. So I've never really dyed with that one since. Um, New World dyes, now we're going to get over to what is what was in the United States and both in the in both of the Americas. So wool, the production of wool in, um, in, in the colonies was prohibited because the king and all of his buddies wanted um, the colonists to purchase wool fabric and wool from, um, from England. So it was against the law for um, colonists to even raise sheep. So they did raise sheep in, in, I guess, in secret. And then they also harvested linen and um, spun the linen and wool together. And that's what you call Lindsay Woolsey. And that's what a lot of um, colonists wore in those days. This is a picture of um, George Washington's breeches and coat that he wore at his inauguration. It is made out of American wool. And um, it was pretty much to have a suit made out of American wool when he was inaugurated was kind of a slap in the face to the Brits. Um, and so Thomas Jefferson was the same way. He had an inaugural jacket made out of um, American wool. And then so did James Madison. So it was kind of a protest to England that you know we had our own stuff over here. So oak bark, the American black oak produces a great yellow and it's called Quer Quercatron. It was, um, it was discovered, actually, the colonists here knew about it, but then this British guy came over and um, visited <clears throat> and he discovered it. So he took it back to England and patented it as Quercatron. And so he had the patent on using black oak to dye for years. Um, Cochineal is a very interesting, this cochineal is from a mealybug insect that feeds on Opuntia down in South America and the Yucatan Peninsula. And so all those little white specks on those things, all these people go out and they like scrape them off and then they dry them. They're, it takes like hundreds of these things or thousands of them to make a, a, a little bit of dye, but it is very concentrated. And it was, once it was discovered in the 16th century, the Spanish exported it to Europe where it replaced the Kermes dye. It's very strong, it's very concentrated. Peru produces about 85% of the world's production of cochineal. And cochineal is used by pharmaceutical companies and food companies to color their medicines. Um, let's see, cough syrups. I always like to do this with kids. Um, ask them if they like gummy bears. Yeah, 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 we like gummy bears. You like the red gummy bears? Yeah. Well, gummy bears are dyed with this insect. And so I would hold up, I would hold up this little vial of um, insects. But the, when, um, when red dye number two, and that what it was called, came out and everybody was saying that it was a, a carcinogenic pro product, all the companies went over to using cochineal, which is kind of interesting. But cochineal makes reds and oranges and purples, and it's it's a it's a fun dye to have, but it doesn't grow here. Logwood is another tropical plant. It comes from Central America. It yields blacks and blues. That the colors that are up there on the screen are um, from from logwood. There were logwood battles between the British and the Spanish when um, back in the days of the pirates, a lot of times the cargo that would be shipped was logwood and somebody else would go steal their logwoods. It was, a, it, coloring, pe coloring your clothes was a big deal in those days. Um, it's, all, it's still used as a stain for biological work and it's, um, and it's also a stain for woodworkers. Blackberry is a common plant. You can grow blackberry. Um, if you use the berries, you're gonna get that color, kind of a deep pink color. However, berries in general might make 
a pretty dye when you first see it, but they're not light fast and they fade. So um, the one time I ever used blackberries, I actually cut the canes and threw them in a pot and boiled them. And I got kind of a, um, a greenish color. And then I, I put, I'm pretty sure I used alum and put the yarn in the dye pot with, um, with the blackberries. And I got this really cool green, which I would, it's kind of a grayish green. I really liked the color, it was pretty. Um, but that's something that you can grow and harvest. Cosmos, everybody knows Cosmos. That's just a common plant. Um, the dye pigment, pigment, you get yellows and golds and vinegar, and you get reddish and orangey colors if you put a little bit of ammonia in there or washing soda. Dyer's Coreopsis, this is one of my favorites. I um, Coreopsis tinctoria. I have bought it. I have planted it in two places where I lived. I just moved to a new house and I haven't gotten, I can't buy any seeds for anything. Um, so <clears throat> I guess when all this is over, I will get myself some Coreopsis tinctoria. It might be next year. But they, they dye yellows and oranges and they're very pretty. And um, it self seeds. So once you have it, it's hard to get rid of it. Goldenrod, goldenrod goes ev grows everywhere. It even grows over almost right on the ocean. When I lived at the Outer Banks, I was surprised. It's a little bit deeper yellow color than this color here. Um, this color came from where I lived in the Shenandoah Valley. And it dyes really bright yellows and it's, it's almost in one of those instantaneous things. When you put the, when you put the yarn in a um, goldenrod dye bath, it turns that color almost instantly. Tick seed sunflower, um, they grow all over waste fields. They grow everywhere. And they grow, they bloom in late September. And um, you get yellows and rusts from those and you can use the entire plant or you can, I would never just go pick the flowers. You can just cut off the stems and use the whole thing. Marigolds, um, you just pluck the flowers off. You could probably use the whole plant, but marigolds are so prolific. Um, you could just pluck the flowers off over the summer and just put them on a screen and dry them. And you get yellows and oranges with that. Now again, when I'm saying the colors that you get with it, the colors that I'm telling you you're gonna get is if you use alum as a mordant. Onion skins, um, I just wanted to show you the two different colors. The, the one on the left is, is dyed with um, red onion skins and the other one on the right is dyed with yellow onion skins. So you get a, you get a deeper or like yellow, golden yellow um, with onion skins. Prickly pear. This is where, these are, the, these are the prickly pears that I actually pulled off. It didn't occur to me that they had those little like Velcro sticker things that stick in you. Um, but anyway, I, got, I, I ended up figuring out, I, since I lived at the beach, I filled up a, a container with sand and I just rubbed those things in the sand to get the stickers off because I read that that's what the Native Americans did and it worked. Um, so the, the yarn up at the top, that real fuchsia colored yarn, that was all dyed with prickly pear. But, and I have, and I spun it and it was very pretty, but now to look at it, it's all turned that yellow color that's down there at the bottom. It was a, it's not a, it's not a, it's not light fast. Oops, I hit the wrong button, I'm sorry. Okay, pokeweed. Pokeberries make that beautiful burgundy color down there at the bottom. You get reds, pinks, corals. I got one of my sons to go out when we lived in the valley. I had lots of um, pokeweed. And so I got him to cut a five gallon bucket full of pokeberries. <laughs> and he brought them home and we put water in them and I put a lid on it and I let those things ferment because that's what I was trying to do research and figure out how to die with it. Because I had so many people ask me, have you ever died with pokeberries? Well, I have once and I'll never do it again. Um, so after I, 
when I dyed the yarn finally, and I did this at a, at a demo, I got those beautiful burgundy colors. It was absolutely gorgeous. It smelled so bad. I took it home. I hung it up out in the garage. We had a separate, like a farm building. So it was out in the farm building. It hung up there for months. And I took it in the house to, to wash it and it still smelled bad. So I had to take it back outside. And a year later, that stuff smelled. So I never used it. But it did make a pretty, did make pretty colors. Black walnut, here's my, here's my favorite plant. Um, haven't found any black walnuts here in Raleigh yet, but I'm sure they're here. So the colors up there on the left are um, from, my, from my plant or from my dying efforts. The thing up at the top in the blue bowl looking thing, those are my black walnuts in a pantyhose leg, in a pot. And that's why I, I, I keep them in that. It keeps them, it keeps the yarn really clean. And, um, and the, the color is just amazing. And then when you're ready to dye with it, you just pick that thing out and put it over somewhere, let it hang for a little bit and you can reuse it again. Black walnuts is a fun, is a fun dye. I have, instead of using um, black walnuts one year, I, I was going to a crafts fair and the crafts fair was, earlier in September and the walnuts had not dropped. And so um, I went and I cut branches, young branches with leaves of black walnut and put them in a, in a dye pot and actually got browns out of it. So you actually don't have to use the nuts. Um, sumac is another one that, that I love to dye with. Um, and I'm using Roos Glabra, Glabra. Um, it's the one, it's the sumac that makes those red looking berry things. Now sumac also, it produces tannic acid. So you can use the leaves and boil the leaves up and strain them off. And then you've got tannic acid if you wanted to dye cellulose fibers. But all I really wanted to dye with was the, was the red. And I really wanted to see what color I was going to get. And believe it or not, I got tan. And, um, and it was a real pretty color tan, but it was still tan. And it, it was, um, I actually changed it just a little bit by adding just a little bit of iron. And I got this real pretty silvery gray, which is, I love the silver gray better than the tan. So, um, so I redyed everything with um, iron. So Osage orange is, um, it's a plant that grew it was very prevalent in the Shenandoah Valley. It was in every fence row. Um, and it, I never died with it because the trees had these, I don't know if you can see them, but they had these thorns on them. They had nasty thorns on them. So you really couldn't get real close to the tree. Um, but if you, knock, <laughs> if you knock the tree down, which we did when we were building fences, the roots were this unbelievable orange color. But um, they got disappeared before I could go out and harvest them. My husband thought I was crazy. Um, but in World War I, Osage Orange is what the, um, the Allies used to dye their, their troops' uniforms khaki. So it makes kind of a, a khaki range to it. Hey. Uh huh. a couple of questions here for you, if you don't mind me stopping you. I will uh -huh. stop. One person asked if you use the black walnuts in the husk or do you remove the husk first? The whole thing. The whole thing. So you I use the entire it thing. Falls. Huh? So you just pick it up when it falls on the ground. Yep, I pick it up when it falls on the ground. Okay. I try to leave try to leave some for the critters that want to eat walnuts, but anyway. Okay. Second question. Have you ever used items like beets or blueberries? Yeah, I've never used blueberries. I have used beets. Um, the problem with using beets is that, now I tried this once before, I bought real beets and I boiled real beets so that I get color. And I didn't get very good color out of those beets. But if you bought canned beets, <laughs> they, they were that color. So it makes you wonder whether 
those canned beets are dyed with cochineal or are they really that color? Anyway, um, I only used it once and I used it um, doing an East, like naturally dyed Easter egg thing with some kids at the library in Allen County one year. But yes, I use beets, but not blueberries. Blueberries are too good to eat. <laughs> okay, that's all for now. Thank you. Okay, all right. So as Debbie said, and as I have said, I love talking to people. Um, and so I, if anybody asked me to come demonstrate natural dyeing, I would do it in an instant. So this was just the, this was the product of just one day at um, the Shenandoah Valley Fiber Festival in Berryville, Virginia. The, the yarns on the left were dyed with um, either iron skins or coreopsis first, and then they were dipped in indigo to get that green color. I don't really like yellows too much. You don't see very many yellows in anything that I ever weave. Um, I like to turn green. So, um, the yarns on the right are all from black walnut. This is at the same fiber festival. This is um, this is all the indigo that I dyed. Um, this was just I had the <laughs> this was my driveway at the house that I just sold. Um, the colors did go af go away after a while, but I was teaching a natural dyeing class to a bunch of ladies in my um, fiber guild at the Outer Banks, and we used matter indigo, onion skin, no, marigolds, I think that was it. And, oh, and black walnut. I had some black walnut. So here's the naturally dyed indigo, uh, not indigo, Easter eggs that I did with um, school kids. So I used onion skins, I used beets, and I used red cabbage. Now red cabbage gives you the blues. The onion skins give you the yellows and the and the beiges, and then the the pinky colored ones are um, beets. But again, I had to use canned beets. It, I could not get any color to come out of regular beets. Maybe you have to put them in a pressure cooker or something. I don't know. So this is a <laughs> I found this at a thrift store at the Outer Banks. It's a handmade egg basket. And I'm pretty sure that the, the reed color, the brown color that's in that basket, besides the little, um, there's actually some vines in there that are dark brown. But anyway, the reed that's in there, I'm pretty sure that that was done with um, black walnut. This is the only thing that I had, only cotton that I have ever dyed. I took a class from a lady who came down from Canada to um, Pennsylvania to a conference, a fiber conference that I was taking. And she taught us how to dye cotton with, with natural dyes. So this is my, um, I dyed with matter. And then on the sides, you kind of see like a lighter color, gray, brown color. That was logwood. And when I, when, when I first dyed with the logwood, of course it was like a purpley blue color, but it faded to that color, but this was done in 2017. So it's, I'm pretty sure it's gonna hold its color. So I guess I'm at the end of my, um, my little spiel here. My son, who lives right down the road from me, when he was in second grade, he wrote this little poem and I just loved it because he said, mom gets the colors and then starts looming, oh, the colors she looms which, which he spelled W-I-T-C-H, come from the flowers blooms. Um, anyway, I just like to put that in because he, he recognized that I like to, to dye stuff. Actually, he was one of my partners in crime. Whenever I would see a plant that I wanted, I would say that I wanted it and my husband would refuse to get it and then the kid would go get it later <laughs> and bring it home for me. So these are, uh, this is in your, um, this is in the handout that I gave you. I gave you some um, 
some reference books that, that I dearly love. A lot of them are out of print, but if you can get the one called A Weaver's Garden by Rita Buchanan, that's a, that's a really good book to have because she talks about, she read this book and I think she was from Charlottesville. And um, so she grew a lot of the plants that I like to die with up there in her garden. And this is just about Dare County Master Gardeners. And that is it. I'm done. <laughs> Let me unmute myself. Thank you so much, Pink. I learn oh, something welcome. new every time I hear you talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, Can we do some virtual clapping for you. Thank you. <laughs> so, if any of you all are knitters, you if you get yourself some hundred percent wool, I actually in my handout, I think I told you how to do that, but you just get hundred percent wool. Um, make sure that it's it's not been dyed or anything. You have to wash it first. And then you can take it and you can get yourself some alum. And I'm pretty sure I put that formula in the, um, if I didn't email it and let you know the formula of alum to water, then you put the yarn in that alum and you let soak, you store it. For an hour and you just let it sit for a while and then after that you if you have dye stuffs that you want to experiment with go for it i mean i just cut down a bush here in my yard it was a mahonia and it stuck me when i walked by it had stickers on it and as i was cutting it down i noticed that the wood was really yellow and i have a feeling i could have used that to dye with but i didn't <laughs> I just got rid of it. But um, anyway, there's, it's interesting the things that you can use to die with. But I will tell you that I, people have asked me, you can't use mushrooms to die with. However, if you don't know what you're doing and you, and you get some kind of a mushroom that's poisonous, you may kill yourself by breathing the, 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 the steam that comes off of, of using mushrooms. So I would, don't use mushrooms. You can get, you can get browns, beautiful browns out of black walnuts. You can get them out of um, hickory nuts. You can get them out of uh, probably English. Well, I, I think pecans would probably die also. I just haven't lived in an area where there were pecan trees, but um, I'll bet you pecans would die brown too. Anyway. Thank you. Thank you, Keen. Um, I've typed my name um, in the chat box, my email address in the chat box again. So if you'll shoot me an email, I will send you the two handouts that Keith had for us tonight. Uh, maybe by next time I'll figure out how I can post them and give you a link to where you can go download them yourselves. Uh, but thank you all for joining us. Uh, this is our first attempt. So Please also, if you have any uh, feedback, positive or negative, send that to me and let me know. We're learning. So we hope you um, enjoyed this tonight and uh, hope you'll join us because probably next week, next month, we're probably gonna be via Zoom too. Our speaker next month is gonna be Jennifer Crumpler. She is the recycling coordinator for Union County Public Works. And she's, her topic's gonna be recycling right. She's going to talk to us about what can you put in your recycling, what can you not? Should you take the lids off? Should you leave them on? Uh, so she's going to clarify some of that because if a load is contaminated when it gets to the recycler with anything that's not supposed to be in there, they refuse the whole load and it costs the cities and the counties money. And a lot of times now, um, the municipalities, it's costing them money to recycle. At one point in time, it was kind of a, a fund generator for them, but now it's kind of gone the opposite way and they're not making money. So if they have to, if a load is refused, uh, it costs them even more money. So uh, she's our speaker for next month. It will be, the date will be um, May the 7th at seven o'clock and it will be advertised via Zoom. Uh, thank you all for joining us tonight.
Uh, I hope you enjoyed Keith's presentation. Uh, she does an awesome job. And thank you so much, Keith. Oh, you're welcome. Everybody stay safe. Yes. And that, that's the other thing. Practice social distancing. <laughs> <laughs> and stay healthy. Thank I'm you. I'm trying to sit six feet away from this computer. It's hard. <laughs> I know. Uh, <laughs> I have recorded the meeting, so I will post that. Um, we'll probably post some, we'll post it either on the Union County Master Gardener website, uh, a link to where, you know, if you know somebody else that might be interested in watching it, they can. Okay. So, thank you all for joining us tonight and I will, uh, stop recording, which will end the meeting now. Okay. Thank Good you. Night, Good, Good night, Debbie. Good night, everybody.